we're really used to seeing each other in shorts, rugby socks, dirt, mud, and not actually suitable booty controls, which is rather strange. Anyway, 60 years last year, which is a massive milestone for us. Um, and if I tell you that Simon, been part of that club for 29 out of 60, um, he is the expert on all things Jersey. We have got one of the largest, if not the largest, any <coughs> new section in the county with, I think, nine or 500 kids playing every week, keeping them off the streets, keeping them out of trouble, keeping them fit and healthy, bringing them up with the values of rugby, teamwork, respect, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but as you can see, we've probably got one of the smallest clubhouses in the county. Um, it's a great successful club that we are so popular, but obviously we're really massive challenges as far as a club. Simon, over to you. What are those challenges and how do we deal with them? Yes, well, um, I suppose the, the size of the clubhouse is only part of the challenge, really, uh, if, uh, if I'm honest. We have a huge amount of footfall, so those children, plus the activity here on a Saturday, which includes three senior men's teams, we have a ladies' section who are keen to grow. Um, it does bring a lot of use, uh, wear and tear, and there's some of my uh, colleagues from the management committee here who will testify about how we try to balance how we run the club uh, against the, uh, the pressures that brings. So, um, so we've got a number of challenges, but if we're talking specifically about the clubhouse and the fabric of the building, um, yes, on a Saturday, well, this evening, you know, we've got a nice clear empty space. It's pretty clean down here. <laughs> And, um, you know, we can move around freely and actually hear ourselves think on a Sunday morning. It's slightly different. We typically do our queue lasting from that, serving hats there all the way to the bar for drinks and uh, burgers and so on. And we've got children in muddy kit uh, all over the place. And our big challenge is trying to balance the desire to have a, uh, a clean, friendly, warm, uh, welcoming space for anyone else who comes here, whether that be someone who's hiring the place or using it on a Saturday or for some other event, uh, and also it being able to corral and uh, offer support and uh, refreshments to parents and all those players on a Sunday. And it's a small space. Uh, we try to keep it, you know, it's utilitarian, it's pretty basic. We spent a lot of money refurbishing it in the summer, so it's much more welcoming. But Trying to balance that is the, is the big problem, really, uh, because we need to try and maximise the opportunities that it gives us for uh, hiring it out and uh, revenue and that sort of thing. Just so people get an idea of the challenge, you just mentioned that we refurbed this house in the summer. Some of you may have been here before it was refurbed, um, or have some memories of just how pleasant it was. Um, we did our best. <laughs> we used a lot of domestic offs, but what it just to get a scale of things, just how much work was it just to refurb this one space, this one area? Well, it cost uh, about £50,000 in total. Uh, we had to do a complete rewire. Uh, what, uh, I hesitate to mention what we found when we went up into the uh, uh, loft space, but uh, the wiring did need replacing throughout, so that was the uh, big single uh, expense. Um, but really what we were keen to do was uh, that the, the phrase, we did manage to get a £10,000 grant from the RFU, the phrase that the RFU used for their programme was transforming social spaces and the key word being transforming. What they were keen for it to become was uh, welcoming a space where there were, it was possible to circulate uh, in a, a free way. They're gearing up to the Rugby World Cup that's in England in the autumn. And what they want is clubs to be well set up to welcome what we hope will be, you know, people who want to watch it on the TV or generate an interest in rugby that they'll want to follow through after the Rugby World Cup's over. So we changed a lot. We moved the entranceway to there rather than close to the bar because people were trying to get into the clubhouse when it was busy and just keeping a big queue. Um, it's been decorated. We lowered the ceiling. We've got uh, inset lights which we can bank. We've got some new media centres which you can use on a multifunctional basis. So um, we put a new bar through into the lounge area. Um, so and changed all the doors. So actually, I look around now and I think it's hard to remember what it was like before. Uh, some nodding, you know, Mark's nodding because those of us who were here before, it was a much darker, gloomier place. It was brickwork rather than the nice clean lines that you see now. 
Um, and uh, you know, he, he didn't want to hang around much. It was a proper rugby compound. Yeah. <laughs> School of hard knocks. <laughs> So, uh, so it, it took a lot of effort. We had to get contractors in because uh, this is a community amateur sports club. Uh, all the people who run it and are involved in it are volunteers. So we've all got day jobs. Uh, there's no way we could have done this scale. We do some of the work around the place under our own steam, but a big scale project had to be done properly and had to be uh, managed and coordinated with decorators and plasterers and chippies and electricians and the like. So the next step, Obviously, it's the change rooms, it's massive. The raffle that we're running for the shirt that Ben's kind of designed is for our Change for the Future project. So, can you tell the room a bit more about the massive challenge that is <coughs> yeah. Project 2015? Sure, well, I mean, anyone who's been in our changing rooms, well, I'm happy to take you in there if you want. <laughs> uh, we'll understand exactly why uh, we need new changing rooms. We need new changing rooms for a variety of reasons. Firstly, they're too small. Uh, secondly, they're pretty grotty, actually, um, and um, they're just unable to cater for the type of footfall we have. So we've already talked about the numbers, but actually it's more complicated than that, because amongst those numbers we have girls, we have boys, we have men, we have women. We have match officials now who may be uh, women as well as men, and so if you're trying to chain, have activity at the same time, you have a real problem. We cannot have girls and boys in the chain same time. We can't have men and boys and girls in the, uh, at the same time. Um, so the, the whole point of this new changing facility is to allow all of that activity to happen at the same time if it needs to. So we've got purpose-built changing room uh, as part of the plan, which means that the six changing rooms in there, because we've got three full-size pitches, so the, the six changing rooms can be uh, closed off from one set from another so that you could have women, men, and children in there, or girls, boys, and men at the same time with separate entrances, separate showers, and everything like that. So it actually caters, it's designed to cater for the type of footfall uh, that we have. And it's a bit of a phased uh, process, really, because we've got what we call social spaces one and two as part of our program. So what you see here and next door is social spaces one, where we've uh, given it a real facelift make it more welcoming, hopefully people will stay longer or come up here to watch a rugby match in the autumn or whatever it may be. Uh, but we've still got all those space challenges, the big queues in the kitchen, the kitchen's too small for the footfall. So the plan is that we get our changing rooms just behind the clubhouse here and then we knock through into the old changing rooms, we tarp those up and they become an extension of our social space, which is social spaces too, which means we move the toilets out there, we knock the kitchen through that becomes bigger and has a hatch onto the decking. You know, we, in other words, we've got a clear plan for how there's a knock-on effect to, it's not just about the changing rooms, in other words, having new changing rooms revolutionises the whole use of this small clubhouse that you've already mentioned. So that's the kind of programme that we've got in place um, with, uh, you know, with that strategic hat on. Obviously it comes at a massive cost. Um, we've got businesses in the room, in an ideal world, somebody would step up and go, yay, we've got half a million pounds, we'd love to give you to build your changing rooms. Uh, the reality is, money's tight for all businesses, but there are things that businesses can do where perhaps you don't need to put your hand in your pocket. In an ideal world, yes, we do. We need to raise money, we need to raise a heck of a lot of money for the changing room. But is there anything that businesses in this room or in the wider business community can do that doesn't involve them donating a massive amount of money that will help us as a club? achieve our objectives for changing rooms? I'm, I'm sure there are. I mean, first of all, sponsorship, I would, it would be foolish of me not to say that it is always welcome, uh, but that doesn't have to be large amounts. Uh, we can put sponsorship packages together to see whether we can offer uh, a business something that would be attractive to them. Um, but in terms of other uh, ways in which anyone can support the club, uh, it can be through um, uh, donations in kind, so whether that be expertise, or indeed uh, labour, um, or uh, perhaps mates rates on, on something, or, or a network of contacts. So actually, we don't know much about that. We don't do that, but actually I know somebody who does, and they really like rugby, and they like that. So, so there's a range of ways, I believe, in which uh, people can <coughs> help us, uh, and it doesn't have to be about cash. 
Um, obviously, cash is helpful too, and we do need it, but actually, that's not what it's all about. We know there are ways in which other people can support us. Fantastic. If anyone wants to chat afterwards about ways in which they can support us as a club, that's great. Um, all the help that we received. But moving on a little bit now, um, I don't want to be soon to be back with my baby in the all the time. <laughs> um, we are extremely proud here. I'm very, very grateful to um, our local international, Ben, um, who really does a lot for us. I, I think, actually, we're, we're kind of lucky because he's, he's our lad. But how important do you think it is at grassroots level rugby as a whole that elite players, premiership players, I mean, championship players, come out and get involved in their local rugby club to help keep the Indian youth up side, keep the profile of the clubs there, and inspire people to carry on playing rugby? <coughs> it's hugely important. I mean, we're really lucky with Ben because <coughs> he's maintained that connection with the club. Uh, this is his uh, second visit in recent weeks to us, and I know he's down again on Sunday, so we really appreciate uh, that connection. Um, but it, uh, it's, um, I think what it, it does a number of different things. First of all, it's excellent for the reputation of the club. I'll make no bones about it. You know, the, the ongoing uh, relationship that we have, the photo calls and so on that we get, we're able to generate, just generate interest. Uh, I'm sure most of you are here to listen to him, not to me. Most. 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 But uh, I think it, uh, Ben's also an excellent role model about what you can achieve, you know, with an um, uh, application and dedication and also a high level of skill. You know, uh, Ben, I remember him as a six-year-old coming here uh, and going through the ranks and playing for us when he was 18 and then going off down to the Scarlets and then coming back to Gloucester and, uh, you know, uh, one of the best number eights in the world. And um, that's a... a been through a lot of hard work on his part and our youngsters can come up here and look at him and think, I can do that, if he can do that, I can do that. You know, local lad, went to KLB, played at Thursday, I can do that. He didn't play representative rugby anywhere else other than going, making that big step up to where he got. So, so it's, a, it's an attraction for us, it's great for our reputation, it's great to see him here because people like to come and meet him and he's a lovely bloke with it and he's always got a, a handshake and a chat for all of us here and maintaining that connection and his you know his parents come down here as well and he's got a couple of brothers who played here as well so you know that's really important to us we're we're actually <coughs> fortunate that we've got a, a, quite a number of players who've gone on to play at a higher level we've got some players at Cinderford we've got some players who uh, recently played for Mosley someone who's playing for Richmond for example Ben and Charlie Sharples who also played in the same age group uh, at Gloucester, so it's great for us, and we long may continue. Fantastic, that's great. I mean, we love to see you there. We think you're great. <laughs> <laughs> um, has anybody got any questions for Simon about the club or sponsorship, or are you all waiting for Ben? Um, very quickly, sorry, sorry, Ben, to delay you. Um, no. Really, not not so much a question, more an observation around how important it is that Dursley's always been a very inclusive club. I think it's possibly worth just sharing that mm. inclusiveness with yeah. the members here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, that is a fundamental part of our philosophy here. Um, we uh, there were many a new sections here previously, but we relaunched the current setter back in 1993, um, and we've been clear all along that uh, the rugby that takes place here on Sunday is about participation. And one of the, I'm absolutely convinced that one of the reasons why we have high numbers here and we keep a lot of those youngsters playing all the way through is that our coaches like Nadine or Mark or others play and blend them, play the players. They all get game time. Um, and uh, there can be nothing more disheartening than uh, uh, teams only ever putting out their strongest team winning and wanting to win every game at all costs. Uh, we've always understood that actually uh, how a player is when they're 8 or 9 is no indication what they're going to be like when they're 18 or 19. And their shapes and sizes change enormously. And you invest in that participation. It's about growing participation in sport as well as achievement in sport. And we're trying to, constantly trying to achieve that balance. 
we want to be successful on the pitch, don't get me wrong, and there will be games where a coach will say, sorry lad, you're not going on, this is too tight to call, you know, but as long as everyone knows, well, I'm going to get a game next week, then you can balance that out, and I think that's really, really important for us, and something that, as long as I'm chairman, we'll maintain, as long as the people we've got involved in running it, we will maintain. Um, so, participation is a key part of our philosophy, and um, I think, you know, long may it continue. So we're trying, that's one of our priority areas, is girls and women's rugby at the moment, to so, grow that part of the uh, activity. Excellent. Have you got any more questions for Simon? I mean, once we finish the Q and A with Ben, we'll both be milling around anyway. So if you have got a burning desire to ask him something that you're too shy to ask in front of everyone else, I'm sure he'll oblige and uh, an answer for you. In the meantime, thank you, Simon. Uh,